a book review by Splitting the Sky and Joshua Blakeney of Earth into Property, Colonization, Decolonization and Capitalism, written by Professor Anthony J. Hall, February 26, 2011. Joshua Blakeney, a graduate student at the University of Lethbridge, and um, uh, Splitting the Sky um, is my friend, and he is a famous author and activist, and a uh, veteran of the Attica State Prison debacle. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the uh, recently published text, uh, Earth into Property, Colonization, Decolonization and Capitalism, which is authored by Professor Anthony J. Hall, who is Professor of Globalization Studies at the University of Lethbridge. Split in the Sky and myself have both read the book, and so today we'd like to uh, uh, share with you why we think it is such an important and significant text for those of us who care about big issues in the world, like world peace, international law, and the plight of indigenous peoples, um, who are often faced with uh, coercive and misanthropic uh, power structures restricting their, their livelihoods. So, so some of the themes that are, are central to the book will be discussed in this YouTube video. So Splitting the Sky, what, what did you particularly uh, like about the book uh, Earth into Property, Colonization, Decolonization and Capitalism? What I found reading word for word within about three weeks it took me to read this book. And what I found <clears throat> which was an exhausting task, but there was so much information that addressed the whole question of colonization against indigenous populations and the decolonization struggles of indigenous peoples domestically and abroad. Uh, in fact, what I got from the book was that the book was screaming for people to understand the conflict that exists in this world today between the, the proper usage of the rule of law in order to maintain checks and balances in a society for the good of the society, good law, uh, versus the ruthless lawlessness of the rise of the tyranny state. And so being an indigenous Mohawk as well as part Cree from the Six Nations Haudenosaunee people, the people of the Longhouse, I am a Ganyonge Hoga, which is our traditional name. Ganyonge Hoga is the people of the land of the Flint, but we're also known as Mohawk. And so I come from a culture that advocates the rule of law. Now, one must understand that the Guyanagoa, when you look at the system, really was the roots of, of the principles of democratic processes. Uh, for instance, uh, in the Guyanagoa, the whole concept of the two-thirds majority vote, which is used at the assembly, General Assembly level, came from the Guyanagoa. The, the Constitution law. of the United States of America, too, I believe. Absolutely. The United yeah. States Constitution, as well as the Charter of Rights and Freedoms of the Canadian, the whole process of the parliamentary proceedings and the congressional proceedings, mm. the whole question of the Senate, and that whole body, the working of the, 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 the parliamentary and congressional processes and the constitutional law came from the oldest constitution, the Guy and the Goa. Hmm. So if people read uh, Professor Hall's book, will they get an understanding of? What Professor Hall clearly shows in this book starts out with the conflict that arose between the British and their cousins, the Americans, who branched off. And in showing the history of the Americans after the American Revolution, 
and the whole question of manifest destiny, the move west, the move west in the in in, in the Madison, the Monroe Doctrine, and the whole removal of indigenous populations and the death and genocide of thousands, if not millions total, indigenous populations. Professor Hall clearly shows that the Americans would not buy into the, let's say, the relationship that the British held through its agents, William Johnson, with the indigenous populations in Canada, who had basically established at least some respect of the rule of law and the right of indigenous populations to maintain themselves as a self-determining people, as a sovereign people, and that uh, from the time of King George and the 1763 Royal Proclamation, before that, during the time of the Pontiac Wars, uh, which, uh, which, which the great alliance of indigenous peoples got together, war societies, and fought off the effects of British colonialism in North America, but seeing that we still uh, represented a major military power, we were then asked to come in as allies with the British. And then, of course, then there was a law that, uh, that was changed on historical levels, which uh, Professor Hall is able to show in Earth and the Property. There was Papal Law, the 1492 Tierra Nullis, those doctrines that were very demeaning, that caused for the colonization and the murder of uh, countless native peoples in North America, all the way down to Central and South America, uh, until Bartholomew de la Casas asked the next reigning Pope, Paul III, to intervene and re rescind that papal bull in the 1532 papal bull, Sublimus Dias, which then said that indigenous peoples were not animals but in, in, and possessed a soul and had the intelligence to enter into legal agreements with, uh, with the crown. And that 1532 was the basis for another uh, precedent-setting case, Mohagans versus Connecticut in 1704, where the Queen Anne uh, got her privy council and the Queen Anne's court basically ruled in favor of the Mohagans on the question of title yeah. in the state of Connecticut. And they had the, uh, the War of 1812 and during that time Tecumseh, as he clearly shows in his book, Tecumseh opposed, uh, uh, gathered 17,000 warriors in the Battle of the Falling Timbers and was able to hold the, the American colonists off from the invasion into North America and became allies of the Brits, of the British Crown, and subsequently the, uh, uh, those guarantees that were given by the Crown, though they weren't fully uh, realized and they were sort of sold out in the, uh, the Treaty of Paris, but uh, what happened, basically, at least there was, in, according to the Crown perspective, there was still the, the perspective that indigenous populations must enter into agreements with one another. Consent to things. Consensus. So and if you're going to take any indigenous lands in Canada, so let's say what is now called Canada, uh, you would have to enter into either the indigenous populations, you would have to either purchase their land through monetary purchase and or direct surrender of the land. If you did not meet these requirements according to the Royal Proclamation of 1763, then the whole question of title still remained in the indigenous yeah. and to the indigenous so population. So it recognized indigenous people as having some elementary human rights, which was yeah. something new for colonials. And I think what you're getting at here is that Professor Hall uh, uniquely um, tell, tells us the, tr the story of the transformation of the Western Hemisphere from Earth into property by telling it through the um, encounter between indigenous peoples and the colonizers. And I think one thing that's amazing is that, you know, I took hi uh, history of the USA classes at school and it would be like the first class, oh yeah, there was indigenous people and then they got eliminated. Anyway, moving on to the important history, the white man's history, you know, and there was never any um, inclusion of mm -hmm. indigenous history in that narrative um, after the first class of sort of pre-Columbian conquest. And I think what Professor Hall does is he um, tells the story of North American history by including the uh, indigenous people. They're not just a footnote. The indigenous people are integral to that uh, story because invariably there is this uh, 
antagonism between those who would like to appropriate the lands of indigenous peoples and those uh, and turn it into private property and the indigenous peoples who would obviously like to retain uh, their historic lands. And I think a good example, like you mentioned, with the Royal Proclamation of 1763, where Sir William Johnson had, uh, you know, and Professor Hall puts much emphasis on this in the book, that uh, uh, William Johnson had, had recognised that um, if we're going to do westward expansion, and obviously he was putting the interests of the British Empire uh, as paramount, but he said we can either do this by murdering the indigenous people or we can do it in, quote-unquote, more civilised way uh, by negotiating and striking treaties and doing colonisation through treaty making. Uh, and it, then we see in the, the Declaration of Independence the rhetoric of life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And Professor Hall emphasises this huge uh, moment where we've that we then see the secession, or uh, these secessionists declare uh, independence, and in their document, uh, in their diatribe against King George III, they accuse him of, uh, quote unquote, bringing on the merciless Indian savages, whose known means of warfare is the undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. And Professor Hall suggests that this is perhaps the beginning of the real war on terror, because just as uh, Contemporarily, as Professor Hall documents, the war on terror is dehumanizing and vilifying uh, the indigenous people of the Middle East and Eurasia. So um, from its outset, the United States was uh, against the rights and aspirations of the indigenous people of North America uh, and, and sought to um, do colonization and expansion through genocide rather than through treaty making. And so likewise in Canada today, we see in British Columbia, there's still treaties being made. And in chapter eight of the text, Professor Hall goes into the whole history of British Columbia and contrasts it with the history of California, where as part of the gold rush, you saw uh, massacres taking place left, right and center against the indigenous peoples. And as you said, splitting the sky uh, uh, in, in Canada, there was a slightly different method. That's not to say that everything was perfect and there wasn't coercion, but that uh, as Tony documented, Professor Hall documents in the book, uh, there was a reason that Canada came to, at least till recently, to have a kind of more rosier image in the world. Uh, uh, and, and the US has um, done colonization. It's, it's kind of informal imperialism or what Professor Hall calls imperial globalization. Uh, with a different methodology, one that's far more genocidal. You can imagine in, in Iraq there's no... Uh uh, office of Native Affairs for the Empire, as there was in the British Empire, as William Johnson, who was the first Indian agent of the British Empire, he obviously had to see the indigenous people of North America as human beings who cried, who laughed, who made love. Uh, and this had some effect when you do formal colonialism. I mean, Gandhi, if he'd existed in Guatemala, and Professor Hall argues this in the text, he would have just been assassinated under the, the, the uh, mode of imperialism that the US adopted. And, and Professor Hall says we have to focus Focus on this, um, the what he calls the civil war in British North America, which we could date, say, from 1776 to uh, the end of the War of 1812, and 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 also with the Treaty of Paris, which uh, basically uh, abandoned the uh, constitutional and legal issues, uh, legal uh, tenets, which were enshrined in the Royal Proclamation of 1763, and effectively returned to a kind of white man's club, uh, deciding the fate of the indigenous people of North America, and so uh, so. So Professor Hall, uh, I would say uh, one thing that's very important in the book is that uh, while many scholars do monographs and tell, for example, the war on terror within the context of three or four years or six or seven years or ten years, Professor Hall tells the history of events like the war on terror and the uh, orientation of the United States to the rest of the planet uh, through the, the lens of, uh, or in the context of 500 years of history uh, since uh, what he calls the, uh, the beginning of globalization in 1492. This word globalization became uh, trendy, it became fashionable uh, after the implosion of the Soviet Union at, at the beginning of the 1990s, but yet uh, surely to, to globalize is something that's been going on a lot longer than uh, a couple of decades.